Coffee is for leaders. Hallelujah. And uh, so my take, right, uh, uh, I, I do think AI is going to be impacting every walk of our life, every, everywhere, pretty much everywhere it's coming. And uh, it, it's similar to computers, I guess, right? The whole PC revolution happened. It was not necessarily a bad thing. It was a productivity gain for the whole world. Uh, I think AI will uh, see that that level of productivity gain. Dinakar, thank you so much for coming on the show. What a pleasure to have you. You are doing some incredible things through Blaze uh, and AI. Tell us about what you're working on. And you are the co-founder and CEO of this company. So tell us how you became that as well. Sure. Uh, first of all, Clint, uh, pleasure meeting and uh, thanks for having me on the show. Uh, we at Blaze, we are a physical world AI company. So when, when you look at AI, AI is coming in, in large uh, quantities uh, to the world. And uh, there's the data center part of it, uh, which, you know, GPUs, NVIDIA are creating massive trillion dollar valuations. And then there's outside the data center, everything to do with real physical world, right? We're talking about uh, farms, factories, smart cities, uh, education, healthcare, and uh, defense. Uh, these are uh, real physical world uh, problems, and AI is impact is is coming here to impact them in a in a nice in a positive way. And Blaze is a is is a company that is uh, making uh, you know foundational technology for the physical world. So what what the core of our innovation is a novel uh, chip processor architecture, and then software to enable physical world AI. Uh, so th that's what uh, we, we do at Blaze. Tell me, tell me how you're thinking about AI. I mean, now the whole world is awake to it, right? Um, particularly over the past, you know, two to three years, and it's become the topic to talk about, not just in business and startup, but really in life, as people are, you know, concerned that it might take over the world and their jobs and things like that. Give me just your overall take. Like, what are you thinking about the rise of artificial intelligence? So AI, uh, if you look at it, the science itself is is uh, is quite. Uh, it, it's not just come up in the last couple of years, right? It's it's been around for 30, 40, 50 years. Uh, what is AI? Uh, what is making AI more successful in recent times is uh, the the compute, right? What 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 took probably like a massive amount of compute and uh, and chips uh, because of Moore's law and and the semiconductor uh, technology getting better and better. You could pack all of that into a tiny chip, right? So th that's one one key reason why it's gaining momentum. Of course, improved algorithms, uh, you know, and and over every every year and six months, there's new kinds of AI happening, and and making it very uh, purposeful towards specific use cases, right? I think that that is the other third piece that is making AI uh, very real and practical for our our lives. Uh, that rather than just saying, hey, AI for everything, apply it for a very specific problem, you know, and catch, uh, you know, potential uh, threats before they happen, right, in a, in a defense or a city application, uh, you know, apply it to number plate recognition for traffic violations, et cetera, things, things which are which are very specific, I think, are getting uh, real world deployed. And uh, so my take, right, uh, uh, I, I do think AI is going to be impacting every walk of our life, ev everywhere, pretty much everywhere it's coming. And uh, it, it's similar to computers, I guess, right? The whole PC revolution happened. It was not necessarily a bad thing. It was a productivity gain for the whole world. Uh, I think AI will uh, see that that level of productivity gain. And, uh, you know, of course, uh, oh, oh, you know, certain jobs uh, will be eliminated, but those the hope is those people will be reskilled, right, to to learn uh, newer jobs, just like, uh, you know, typewriters and became computers. I think uh, pre and post AI, people will be upskilled, uh, you know, to use AI for their workflows. I, I do see it going that way. What advice would you have for other leaders or other CEOs around how to be thinking about AI, how to implement it within their company? And then how to implement it within their products, even their product offerings. So I talked to a lot of CEOs, obviously, through this, and a lot of them use it internally, right, uh, to help kind of uh, automate workflows and, and, and things like that. But, uh, but many are like, I don't know how to, you know, productize this or, you know, put it inside my product, which is kind of this interesting, you know, I'm sure that'll come. But what, how do you think about that? I mean, obviously, your, your company literally does this. Um, so, so, so how would you give that 
how, what advice would you have for other CEOs? So I, I guess, uh, Adopting AI is going to, is already happening in almost every company, right? Thanks to Microsoft Copilot, et cetera. It is integrated into your, into your computer, into your software, right? So how, how much you use or use it, et cetera, is, uh, of course, case by case. Uh, things which are obvious, uh, if you have a Zoom video call now, uh, there is, there are note takers, et cetera, right? Instead of actually having a meet, meeting scribe, our company actually practices it throughout. Right. Every, almost every meeting there's a report generated and with action items and so on and so forth. So it is a, it's a productivity gain. We're, we're also dabbling with it in, at other places, uh, like, uh, they, they call, they call this wipe coding or code, automatic code generation, right? Having AI generate certain code, et cetera. Uh, and, uh, the core of our innovation though, in the chip design part of it, uh, thus far, we've not used AI directly. But that's something it's in uh, exploratory stages. Uh, we do have to wait for the chip design tools, the EDA companies to adopt it, right? And make it uh, widely available for somebody like us to, to go and do it. Um, coming to advice, I guess, I think, uh, uh, you know, I can say this, that we, the low hanging fruit for us uh, is cost savings across wherever, you know, using AI in, um, you know, potentially you could uh, save uh, costs up to 20, 30%, right? Depending on the size of your company and the nature of the work. So that, that's where I see the low hanging fruit immediately happening. Uh, everything about documentation, et cetera, et cetera, right? All of these, uh, is the natural thing. And, uh, it, you know, I think people do need to get, uh, so right now all of the AI is happening on, on generic and cloud. So people, of course, don't want to share their data there. Uh, so that's one of the roadblocks. So, uh, but a way to solve it and, and companies are going at it in terms of on-prem clouds and how, how you can actually uh, help, uh, end customers keep their data, but also use AI. I think as that happens more and more, uh, there'll be more adoption, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think that makes sense. I think, I think, I think you're right there. How do you think about, well, well, first give me a sense for like what a typical day looks like for you as CEO of Blaze. So yeah, um, it's a pretty interesting thing. I mean, I'm just coming off uh, a couple of uh, board meetings followed by a couple of other meetings, but a typical day is uh, more like a, uh, I, I try to actually divide my week into uh, a day I spend on uh, everything related to, uh, you know, revenue and customers, then uh, a day related to product, right? Product and tech and innovation. And, and, uh, a, a, day, a day related to, uh, talking to all my uh, team members, right? My direct reports, etc. Uh, and, and then uh, a day, you know, specifically, uh, to everything investors and outbound. Uh, so I try to keep, keep them that way largely. Of course, things do get, uh, uh, you know, disturbed if some, something else comes up. Hey, this has to happen. Uh, on a certain day we prioritize, but by and large, trying to keep it such a way so that uh, I do get quality time uh, with uh, all aspects of the business, I would say. Uh, th that's how I approach it. How do you think about leadership and uh, motivating your employees in this? And, and where have you landed on this whole everybody in the office to work from home to hybrid and all of that type of stuff and just ma overall managing a culture? Sure. We, we have always actually even pre COVID, uh, the, the team, uh, we're a global company. We have teams in, uh, in India, in the UK, different parts of the US, three different places in the US. Uh, so we, we're quite a hybrid company in a way. Uh, we do have offices, uh, but, uh, realize that people have to work at different time zones, right? A lot of development in India and, and the, ch the architects are here in the US. So, so a uh, lot of uh, meetings that happen late nights, early mornings, uh, around the clock. So, uh, so we've been quite quite hybrid even before. We were actually one of the, uh, I, I would say, the first customers of Zoom. When, when Zoom was a, a less than a ten member company, we adopted Zoom into our, our workflows. So uh, we, we've kept it that way. We were quite uh, that. That's why when COVID actually happened. We were efficient. We, we already knew how things would work and, uh, we, we just, you know, we were, we were prepared for it. Uh, that said, uh, you know, some of the activity does involve whiteboarding, uh, solutions and going into the office and discussing. So that also is there. Uh, 
So it's, we, we just make it uh, happen depending on the, the kind of uh, interaction, meeting uh, what is needed, whether it's a virtual or physical. And, and then uh, cross border is right, but there's quite a bit of travel within the company, people uh, visiting different sites as needed to solve, uh, let's say, you know, technical issues, actually the physical hardware, bringing up boards and, and, uh, and so on and so forth. So it, it's a mix, mixture of all of that. Yeah, yeah, and and you've talked a lot about democratizing AI and making it accessible to everyone. How do you? What does that look like? What exactly does that mean? Uh, one of the way to look at AI is it's a it's a super powerful innovation, and it can be uh, impacting everybody, every every business, every every uh, person. So by 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 making the tools and the compute power. Uh, and and the technology is so easy to use and deploy that somebody who is not a data scientist can actually uh, deploy AI. I think that that is how simplified it should become. Just like your you know personal computing history, right? So imagine a doctor who, and this is a real example at Blaze. Uh, a doctor in in uh, Southeast Asia was looking at retina images, and uh, it, it's hard to actually identify a certain kind of, uh, you know, cancerous cells. Uh, applying AI tools uh, and and our, our AI studio, we, we've developed a code-free platform called Studio. Uh, so what we, we have our chips and we have our software. The software is intended to make the life of uh, uh, people, different practitioners, easy to adopt AI. So using our software tools, uh, he could actually identify uh, these cells uh, automatically using, uh, you know, computer vision AI. So, so this is actually pretty transformational, right? Somebody who's not even from the AI background was able to build a solution and uh, deploy it. So, so that to me is very powerful and democratized, uh, democratized version of AI. I think countries, I, I forget which one was it, Norway or somewhere, they have this concept of a citizen data scientist, meaning that anybody who's uh, doing any walk of life should be being able to build an AI uh, solution. And, and that that's underway, right? Initially, it started in uh, all the the deep data center, Google, Facebook, etc., where they have they have all the expertise. But if you look at outside uh, the data center in the physical world, there's a genuine massive opportunity for AI, but also a knowledge gap. So a company that gets it right and addresses the hardware plus software, uh, the act of actually making AI easily deployable is onto something huge. Uh, and and uh, that, that's where we are focused, right? To having uh, the ideal mix of hardware and software, making it like a Macintosh experience so that you can deploy solutions. We've talked a lot about the upsides of AI. What, what are some of the downsides you see? As with any any technology, any new technology, there's, uh, there's bound to be, uh, you know, uh, controversy. There's bound to be uh, potentially the risk of being uh, utilized negatively. Uh, imagine uh, a world where, uh, AI algorithms are being used to, uh, you know, mimic uh, these spam callers, etc. Right, and and you know, try to get people's information, etc. For all bad kinds of things. Those, those are some of the things that are uh, are happening. Uh, they could also be national security related, right? Items. Uh, they do say that uh, new, the next generation battles will not be physical fights, but more about. Uh, cyber-based and uh, complex AI algorithms-based. Uh, so all, all kinds of uh, those things uh, are the negative ramifications of any uh, technology. But then again, uh, we look at, hey, uh, does the good outweigh the bad? And and that's what I, I keep thinking about my, you know, as we, we build our technology and we just try to focus on the good. Yeah, and and focusing on the good, I imagine, can be um, exhilarating, right? And thinking about all of the various things that it can do. What do you read, and what reading recommendations would you have for us? Um, I've, uh, you know, n- nowadays a lot of my reading happens on, uh, you know, short, uh, short things like uh, articles written written on LinkedIn's and uh, and Medium and and so on and so forth. Uh, my wife also uh, tells me about these. Uh, abridged uh, AI abridged uh, you know kind of books uh, an entire book gets summarized into like 15 minutes or 10 minutes while you're on the treadmill uh, I've yet to take to that uh, but yeah I, I think some some of those right and and pod- podcasts etc are actually quite quite helpful you 
you get uh, what, what the person is saying, the emotion of it more, more so by hearing to it. So some of those are interesting. Uh, it, it's just a mixed bag. And, and of course, reading I, my, one of my, um, I like the MIT tech uh, review. That, that's pretty interesting. They talk about new trends, et cetera. And, uh, you know, mixture of different articles and here and there, I guess. How are, um, how are you feeling about this year? You know, we've had a lot of kind of economic, maybe, um, ter- I don't know if turmoil is the right word, but on, un- uh, you know, just you know, kind of confusion, let's, let's say. <laughs> with tariffs and things of that nature. And uh, it does seem like maybe things might be calming down. How are you thinking about the rest of the year from an economic perspective? Uh, we, of course, are paying very close attention to everything that's happening because we our customers are global and our, our supply chain is also global. Uh, our, our chips are manufactured here on, on U.S. soil. And, uh, and and then, so, so we pay very close attention to uh, everything that's going on. We have an outside law firm, an inside council, everybody advising us. On, on the ramifications and we're in constant touch with our customers because uh, as we supply right if, if there are ramifications in terms of tariffs etc how do we uh, make sure the customer gets their product on time and and within what they expected and so on uh, so so it's basically being paying close attention and uh, being nimble enough to act uh, when you like we, we think a lot about at ceo.com the chances one gives is mm-hmm. just as important as the chances one takes yeah when you hear that, who gave you a chance to get you to where you are today? I would say early on, uh, some of the investors and a mentor figure who who backed me, um, and, you know, my godparents who backed me. My uh, there's a mentor figure who uh, was a chip guru investor. He backed us, uh, you know, right when we were in garage mode, and uh, and then the rest is history. So so we definitely beneficiaries, uh, and along the way. Automotive company Denso, right? Uh, they they tested our technology and then they invested, uh, and so we, we've definitely been beneficiaries of uh, you know people rooting for us. And I immensely value all of the support uh, all over the years that we've received. Uh, even till this today, I'm uh, you know I talk to my first investors and uh, they and you know of course uh, quite often and they're and uh, so thankful to all of them that uh, they helped us get here. That's incredible. Well, Dinaker, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, what an honor to have you. Congratulations on everything you've done. I mean, Blaze has had $330 million in funding. You were recognized as the innovator of the year locally there in Sacramento. I mean, it's just, just unbelievable what you're doing. And we kind of scratched the surface here. I hope you'll come back and we'll, we'll, we'll talk more. But thank you so much for coming on. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Clint. Thanks so much. Mm-hmm. 